Welcome to It's All Connected, the podcast featuring some of the best coaches and clinicians in the industry, sharing their knowledge and experience on every aspect of health and fitness. Hey there, welcome to my channel. And today's guest of honor is Dr. Sarah Martin. So Sarah is a PhD in neurobiology from the University of Kentucky. And she is also a physiotherapist who specializes in pelvic floor health and incorporates breathing, strength training, manual therapy to help her clients move and feel better. Hi, Sarah. Welcome to my channel. How are you doing? Hi, great. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Sarah, let's... Pelvic floor is a very interesting topic. Um, a lot of people have a lot of issues in the pelvic floor, and it's usually a hush hush topic. So it's not like a lower back. Oh, I people usually oh lower back. Oh, I have shoulder pain or neck pain. Yeah. But pelvic floor pain. Shh, mm-hmm. Like yeah. So it's a very taboo stuff. But we need awareness regarding this topic. So my, my first question to you would be like the most popular thing. Uh, it's, it's normalized, but it should not be just because it's getting common these days. Constipation. Let's talk oh. about it. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk I'm about it. S- I'm so glad you brought it up because I find myself bringing it up in, in talks and being like, oh, I don't know if they were willing to go there, you know, but you're exactly right. Um, so many people are constipated right now. And we all, you know, and there's, there's so much out there to, um, that are trying, you know, people, like you said, it's hush hush. So, so there's not a lot of people talking to maybe their doctors about it or each other, which sometimes it's, sometimes it's your friends that get you in touch with the right people. Right. Um, because, you know, people schmooze doctors all the time. And so they'll send, you know, they'll send someone to the people that they sent sandwiches to who sent sandwiches to them, you know, uh, but when it comes to, uh, really knowing if someone is right to treat a uh, constipation or to talk about it, it's usually your friends who are like, you know what, I'm constipated too. And I went to this physical therapist or I, you know, I took this supplement, whatever. And so um, one of the things about constipation that people don't realize is it's such a multi-system issue. So a lot of times people think, oh, you know, it's, it's what I'm eating. Uh, mm-hmm. True, absolutely. It could totally be what you're eating. Um, they'll, they'll think, oh, it's, you know, it's their stress. Um, they, you know, they can't, they can't have a bowel movement when they're away from their house or, you know, out. Well, yeah, totally. It's that too. Um, they, and then, but even more down the road that people don't realize some of the the systems that are involved that, um, people, uh, miss is that the muscle system, right? The, or your skeletal, your muscle, musculoskeletal system, your pelvic floor, um, is the gatekeeper of your poop. And so it's it's really interesting. So when I, I brought, I got my pelvic floor model for you and mine's different than a lot of the people I, I know on your podcast that they have a lot of motion in theirs. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Which is great. Um, it's, it's great to show people the mobility in the pelvic floor. This really gets at the concept of what is at the bot, what what mus- what musculature is at the bottom of the pelvic floor. When we see when we see skeletons, a lot of times we don't really think that there's muscles here. We all can imagine muscles on biceps or legs, but um, underneath, so that everything doesn't fall out, is a huge muscle system. Um, and I'm not sure if the video gets it, but there's there's three holes. There's the urethra, mm. right? Um, then on my pelvic floor model, there's three holes on, on men's, uh, pel- pelvic floors. There's only two holes, just so you know. Um, and then there's the, there's the vaginal entrance and, and then the, the anus that goes into the rectum. Right. Um, and so all of these muscles are in charge of what comes in and what goes out of your pelvic floor. And so it's really, really important to, um, when, when things are going well, uh, <clears throat> it's easy to like let the, you know, to, uh, for these muscles to relax when you have to have a bowel movement. But sometimes what happens is the system becomes really dysfunctional. Hmm. And, um, if your if your pelvic floor feels like it's more important to do another work, maybe with your posture or it's very, uh, we'll get into a little bit of this, but if you're very stressed out, um, those muscles tend to pull up and get really guarded. So then when it's time to have a bowel movement, 
they don't remember or they don't feel confident or safe releasing to let out the bowel. The problem is, uh, and we can definitely talk through that if there's a lot there. Um, the problem is that um, it, constipation becomes a vicious cycle. So once, once you have already become constipated and those pelvic floor muscles have pulled up to prevent the bowel, the more constipated you get, the harder it is to release those pelvic floor muscles. So essentially, even if you work hard to try to train to relax those muscles, if you're already, if constipation is already sitting on top, your pelvic floor pulls up harder to hold all of the more, vo more volume in your, in your gut system. And so it's, it's horrible once it gets started. And we've, you know, everyone's been there at probably at some point and some people have essentially lived there for their yes, whole life. De decades. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Some of it can actually start with a, a lack of re reflex integration as little kids. So kids who um, maybe have it like uh, move like movement issues in general um, can also then have the pelvic like have the constipation start then, um, yeah. And you know that's that's decades of problems. And mm. so um, yeah. So uh, that's so yeah. So it's, it's a big issue. Lots of stuff going on. Th this needs to be. Uh known to public that when you are sitting in a toilet this is not normal no no but uh, yeah no it's common but not normal oh uh, yeah uh, you're it's absolutely common. right yeah yeah it's and, common but it's not normal right and so what happens is uh it, it seems like a good idea though i'll tell you you know you, you think that much like well if i just uh, if i grunt and push down that bowel will come out and and a lot of times the feet, there's a positive feedback there too, which is problematic. And when you uh, like that, you can feel you can feel that resistance or that that push down near your rectum. The problem is that when you go uh, like that, you're, what you're doing is your your pelvic floor and your breathing are Connected. they're more than related. They are they are a um, they are the same. They are part of a system they're that one. is working together. Yes, and they should be, and they should work well together. But when you go, uh, you actually, the pelvic floor actually lifts up. It pulls up and contracts automatically. Like, so with exhale, pelvic floors naturally pull up. And so you're pulling up and then you're pushing down, right? Mm. So you're essentially trying to push through a closed door. Horrible idea, right? Yes, people sometimes do it, you know, like if you can get a whole push on there, you'll get, and you know, people will squeeze out They'll be like, well, it works. And they'll squeeze out the smallest little bowel movement and relief. It'll just be, it'll be a little relief to the system. The problem is a, a couple of things. First of all, it can cause, um, it doesn't work well. It doesn't make a functional, um, it doesn't give you what you really need in, to release the bowels because you really need to relax the pelvic floor. But it also can cause hernias. It can cause um, it can cause a prolapse. It, a lot of women deal with prolapse, pelvic prolapse, because what you're doing is essentially like if if you think about a like a water hose, yeah, and you're pushing off the end of the water hose, that the the water that there's not much water that gets through, but what gets through is coming out like a bullet, right? Yep. And so yep. what it will do, yeah, exactly, is it'll push it'll push organs through those small those small holes because of the pressure, the pressure needs to get out. You're never, you're always going to have to have some, something's going to have to give if you build up enough pressure with that uh, Valsalva. Right. So you build up the pressure and something squeezes out. It's not what should have squeezed out, right? Um, but the system gives where at the weakest point. So a lot of men get those like, um, <clears throat> get like the lower belly hernias. Women, a lot of times get pelvic floor because it's the weakest link in the system. So that's what you're going to see. Hmm. So properly, and this a lot of like, I'm going to explain this, but you might not be able to get it without help essentially is when you're pushing, you should be breathing in when you breathe in and not like a breath, because that actually doesn't get into the pelvic floor. But if you can take a low, I always describe it as a heavy breath. So breathing down and ex yes, expanding not only this way, 
but this way. So letting the air get to your butt essentially and get towards your rectum as you take a breath in and it's not a big breath, it's a relaxed breath. Yes. So as you do that relaxed breath, even though it seems so counterintuitive because you're like, this is so uncomfortable, I've got to push this out. Uh. You take that relaxed breath and at the same time, giving a bear down. So you do add some pressure to it on the inhale. A lot of people all cue to hold, to pull their, to like hand, like take it, their hand and push their belly in a little bit as they're doing it to make sure that we're not losing the pressure in the abdomen because it's an easy pressure leak for people. And so you just, you hold the belly, you do that, that low breath as you're pushing and you're gonna be a lot more successful in getting bowel movement out. That being said, if you're chronically constipated, you're probably gonna to have to do some sort of, um, and you kind of can't get around it because I said like that vicious cycle, you'll probably have to do some sort of bowel um, helper where whether it's like a Miralax, which um, is a easy on the system or some people do, you know, like an enema. I hate to talk about all this, but it's just, it is what it is. People who aren't so chronically constipated um, can sometimes like fiber is a great, like a psyllium husk, metamucil. I like psyllium husk because they don't add anything else to it. Um, but some people can't stomach it. So, um, but yeah, adding something to your system to help. Um, most people are deficient in fiber. So that's a oh, good place yeah. to start. It's a mm -hmm. huge issue in India. Huge oh, issue. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah. So fiber is the name of the game. That being said, some people don't, like if, if after a few days you feel worse, some people don't do well with fiber and it actually causes the other problem. Mm -hmm. And so they might have to go to more of a, um, an, like a Miralax, -ish, you know, something that would help. Um, Miralax just brings water into, this, into the guts to help mm -hmm. essentially um, just um, get everything more uh, soft and softened to allow it to pass. A laxative or something, kind of? It is a laxative, but it's a sensitive, la like, so there's a laxative that you take and you're like, oh my gosh, I have to get to the bathroom right now. It's not like that. Essentially you take it, it brings, it works over like a couple of days. Mm. So, Slow. Um, yes, exactly. And it's really like people who are chronically constipated um, sometimes need to be on it for a while. That, so um when you're uh, when you're constipated, what happens? So your rectum is it's the end of the colon, right? And it's full of nerve endings. This is what I love. This is what I love about what I do. It's full of nerve endings. And so as it stretches, just kind of like the bladder, as it stretches, you're sending a message up to the brain that oh, okay, there's bowel here. I need to go sit on the toilet and let it out. But if you're chronically constipated, you're, the, the rectum stops being this place where bowel goes. It starts being a place where bowel sits and it expands that rectum. Mm. Uh, and so instead of being like this and just getting a little bit, it, it starts expanding and those nerve endings lose their, their sensitivity. And so that's why a lot of people are like, oh, I, I poop daily. I can't be constipated. But if, they're, if you're holding bowel in your rectum right above your pelvic floor, that's constipation. And you can imagine what that does to your pelvic floor, just, you know, holding yeah, a yeah. weight um, right above it. And again, that pelvic floor pulls up to try not, you know, to have accidents, all that stuff. And so, um, uh, yeah, so that you stretch out those, the, those nerve endings and your brain starts, lo stops, starts losing the message mm -hmm. that you have to have a bowel movement until it gets way stretched out. Um, so a lot of times with those people, you, they need to be on something for a, like something very like low for a while to help get that bowel out. And then as we shrink the, the rectum back down, they start to get those messages again. And then they can slowly come off some of that medicine. Like I said, it's, it's a bigger, it's a com more complex process than people realize because it can have, it ha can have gotten so dysfunctional, mm. but you're not going to fix it. Like, um, Yes, you can take medicine, but you also need to understand how your pelvic floor works because the medicine isn't be all end all. The I've, I've seen people on tons of medication, the, the, the strongest kinds of medication that still have the pelvic floor issues because they're still doing the, uh, they still have the constipation issues because they're not releasing the muscles of the pelvic floor. Maybe they're not changing their eating. So it's- And also you'll see most of them are not great breathers, mouth breathers, belly breathers. Yeah. Oh yeah. 
because they, they have a dysfunctional pressure system. And if you have a dysfunctional pressure system, you have a dysfunctional pelvic floor, period. If your pelvic floor is being used for posture, you're not going to want to release it to have a bowel movement because it's no longer, it's no longer being used as um, uh, an area that, that opens and closes. When you're using it for posture all the time, not, not just sometimes, but all the time, it just starts just staying closed mm-hmm. because, well, you know, it's, it's being used to, our brains always try, are trying to decide for us what's the most important thing at the moment, right? Mm-hmm. So is it more important to poop or is it more important to deal with the stressors in front of me? Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, bowel movements become like they get pushed off to the side, right? Um, yeah. It's, and so that's, you know, what I do so much of what I do is essentially hacking into people's systems and seeing, um, you know, where, where do I need to help this person to be able to change the patterns that they're going through? Is this, you know, uh, yes, I need to help them change their, their positioning to, and help them improve their pressure systems, help them improve their pelvic floor. But I might have to step back even further and say, what's causing them to want to be in this, in this pattern? Um, is, is it, um, you know, their lifestyle, the stressors in there, and, and there's things that you can change and things that you can't, but sometimes sitting with someone and being like, okay, we can change this, but we can't change this, or, or here's some, you know, breathing, relaxation, meditation to help start beginning to relax the system. True. It, so when the body is stressed out, um, fight or flight it will only look for survival that's it only survival exactly. is the choice that's it yeah. yeah well but here's a cool thing um research wise um the opposite of that so we think oh the body's in you know survival mode and hmm. i'll never be able to get out you know my life is too stressful meditation and this is some really cool research that's come out and um that like neuroimaging research even that when we meditate, our body actually, um, our, our brains actually um, increase um, activation in the, in the basal ganglia, which is part of that movement system. And when the basal ganglia is activated, um, your body is more, more willing to, to, be, to move, which, or it almost like primes the system to move. And so doing meditation first, a lot of times, can then start helping people, um, helping their bodies essentially be willing to relax and yield that pelvic floor. Hmm. So, like we've, cool. we've discussed prolapse and constipation. I want to now talk about incontinence and the brain bowel connection and the brain bladder connection, because this also plays a huge role in that. So if you could go in depth about this. <clears throat> Yes, let's talk about that. Um, let's separate because they're very, oddly enough, they're very different with um, bowel and bladder. So most people don't don't leak bowel, honestly, unless they're constipated, which becomes another issue because people think that they have a weak pelvic, like a weak uh, rectal um, contraction, but they don't. They're actually just constipated and they need to relax their pelvic floor. So that's kind of to the side, unless you have like nerve damage or something. So but bladder leakage, um, that one's a fun one. So um, a, lot of, a lot of women um, get to a point because women have, so first of all, we have an extra hole, which hmm. makes the system a little bit more um, sensitive to, to pressures and to sensitive to, to, to losing strength. Then on, you add giving birth and all of that stuff. So, and, and more organ pressure. So women have to, their, the strength of their pelvic floor plays a bigger role about, you know, leaking um, urine. There's two major types of um, urine leakage. One is stress incontinence, and it has to do essentially with your pelvic floor not being able to overcome the pressures um, pushing down on it. it. It's not strong enough to, to overcome the pressures going down. So that could be um, that, you know, for some people that are really low level, for someone who's much older, that could be standing up from a chair. 
So I didn't feel like I have to go pee, but when I stand up, I leak urine. That's a, they couldn't overcome the pressure of standing up. Mm. That's, that takes, that, that adds to your pressure system. Um, now, then you can get up into, you know, pr- like people who are intense, women, women and men who are intense, like um, CrossFitters. Working, uh, or, working you know, out, yeah. Especially things that ca- like take you to failure. Mm. Um, when you're potentially as, as well as your pelvic floor is being used as that postural muscle too, which makes it kind of do two jobs at once. And so, you know, you, you do so much. It doesn't matter if your pelvic floor is really tight. You, you know, are doing those hard activities to failure or even just a few and that pressure downward, your pelvic floor isn't able to pull up against it and you, and you leak. <clears throat> so that's. Um, like, like uh, yeah. when this is this this and anteriorly oriented, I would say, mm-hmm. and yeah. this inhaled pelvis in an anterior orientation, ER pelvis yeah. as they say. I wouldn't say uh-huh. inhaled. But, uh, so this way, guts are coming and settling down and unable to overcome and go up. So when yeah. they when there's pro- prolonged sitting on the chair guts settle down and when they have to mm-hmm. come up they cannot move their guts up it yeah <clears throat> yeah got it exactly and that's that's really hard on the pelvic floor um because that's a lot of pressure down and then and then potentially they might even be doing a valsal the mm-hmm. right which is then adding extra pressure and that the um the bladder just can't take it anymore. Huh. And uh, like, because you're, you're putting that pressure because the bladder is one of the lower organs. So you're putting that pressure onto the bladder and, and the pelvic floor, the muscles that contract right around the urethra aren't strong enough to stay closed in that situation with that much pressure. And it relaxes and you get, you get that um. leakage, um, which, you know, a lot of, a lot of those you know, you, you change someone's position, you help them, you help them essentially come back into a a better pelvic structure. You help them understand their, their um, pressure systems. So they're not adding to it. So a lot of the work I do with that is helping them understand how to exhale with their bellies coming in. So a lot of people will exhale and their bellies will push out. That's adding pressure, right? And then they're going to leak. And so I'll teach a lot of, I'll teach people how to breathe out only as much as they can breathe their, bring their bellies in. Mm. And then naturally their pelvic floors will pull up just because that's how the system works. Remember, because that, that breathing system and that pelvic floor, the, the, it's actually a diaphragm. It's the pelvic floor diaphragm and the breathing diaphragm are connected. And so they work together as you breathe out, we pull this one up, this one comes up. And we can overcome, we can help overcome the pressure coming down, but then also not adding pressure by um, trying to hold your breath. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so we can teach that system how to work together better um, by, by again, decreasing the pressure as well as helping with helping contract that pelvic floor up the way Mm. it's supposed to using not only like, you know, some consciousness of, of pulling up, but also the system in, internally that helps it, which is that exhale system. Um, a lot of people for physical therapists, they want to try so hard for us and, and for their, their strength trainers too. They just, they want to be the best. And so when we tell them to do something, even if it's as simple as breathe out, they'll breathe out so much that they start to then um, <clears throat> get into compensatory muscles and they'll push their bellies out to breathe to keep breathing out and this is a compensatory system that actually adds pressure and will cause problems so you have to watch people pretty closely sometimes yeah um about what they're doing and a lot of people will already when they contract their pelvic floor nap like before they even before i even start working with them they'll they'll be pushing their pelvic or they'll be pushing out at the same time Mm. so essentially they're adding pressure um to a system um that they're trying to close up and so Um, now that's one kind, the other type of, um, leaking is an urge incontinence. Uh. And this one becomes multi, really multi-systemic. So, um, 
one cause of urge incontinence can just be what you're putting into your bladder. So there's nerves all through your bladder. And it, it's, it's um, the problem is those nerves only know how to, we only read them as one message and that's, I have to pee. So if the nerves of your bladder are active or, or <clears throat> if anything activates them, they automatically send a message to your brain, I have to pee. A lot of women understand this because they've had like a UTI, a bladder infection, and <clears throat> they feel like they have to pee all the time. And that's because those nerves are active, but they're active because there's a bacteria um, in the system that's irritating the nerves. Mm -hmm. We need that messaging, right? Then we know to go to the doctor, get help. Well, those, <clears throat> those nerves can also be activated uh, by, they're, they're normally activated just by filling up the bladder. When your bladder gets full, it stretches out, it activates the nerves, it tells your brain, I have to go pee. And then, you know, with potty training, we there's a there's a, like a frontal cortex involvement that says this isn't the right spot to go pee. Let me get to a toilet. So then you walk to the toilet, and when when you're when the part of your brain says this isn't a good spot to go pee, naturally your pelvic floor muscles have been trapped up. That's that's an actual that's that's a very um, important pathway, neurological pathway. So then you go to the toilet. Your pelvic floor muscles relax, which sends a direct message to your bladder to contract and you're able to urinate, right? Nice, nice system that works for you. The problem is again, that those, those nerve endings in the bladder can be activated in different ways. So they might be activated by, like I said, um, carbonation, caffeination, artificial sweeteners are your three, heart, like are your three, um, major bladder irritants. There's people with certain types of um, um, issues like uh, people with um, interstitial cystitis, with them like tomatoes can activate their, the, can, can irritate their system, um, like uh, vitamin C stuff. So that's, that's another thing. But um, normally, you know, we have these three things that can be major irritants. So so you don't need a lot in your bladder. It doesn't have to be full, but if, it, if you've drank a carbonated beverage, it's gonna, it can irritate those nerve endings and then send a message to, so then your, your bladder, those nerve endings are irritated. So it sends a message to your brain, I gotta pee. Mm -hmm. So then you're going to the bathroom, you're just, you're, you're just peeing out a little bit because there's not much there. Um, and so that, that can be part of what's irritating the system. But, it can also, what can also irritate the system is that mismanagement of pressure. Hmm. So remember we talked about, you know, people who uh, are, have a lot of, um, people have a lot of um, tightness, like, like that stillness tightness around their abdomen, their lower abdomen, that can actually pull on the bladder, which then activates the, the, those nerve endings sending a message to the brain. I got to go pee all the time. They're constantly running to the bathroom. So, you know, when we're looking at this, this is a big system. The most fun one, I don't want to say fun because I mean, it's not fun for them, but it's the uh -oh. easiest to treat are people whose bladders are activated essentially by their brains. So these are people who, um, and you know, there's, there's lots of thoughts about um, why this starts happening as people get older, but essentially what happens is you, let's just say you, you've created a habit. You always get home and you go pee as soon as you get home. So then what starts to happen is your brain starts to be a little ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. And so as you're walking to the door, putting your key into the door, you feel this strong urge and it's, you're already, you're, you're the strong urge of, from your brain saying, Hey, we're home. We, sh we can go pee contracting the bladder, that contraction is so strong mm. that the pelvic floor also relaxes because those two systems are so connected. So you have the strong contraction of the bladder, the, um, the pelvic floor relaxes and they'll just, they'll essentially just empty their bladder on their porch. Really frustrating, really um, nerve wracking for people. And it just, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel good, obviously. Um, but those are the people that are easiest to treat because all I have, like, all we do first is give them something, we, we cack the habit, right? We say, okay, when you get, I make them decide in my clinic, I say, what is, what is the activity you're going to do when you get home that is not going to the bathroom? 
So, and, you know, sometimes it's letting out the dog. Sometimes it's, you know, pick some, one lady, it was, it was brilliant. She's like, well, I'm going to make sure that when I come home, I get everything out of my car and take everything from my car to, to my, to my house and put it away. So it's just an activity. And if they think about it first, then their brain is, is already primed to know that when they get home, they're not going to the bathroom. And so it hacks the habit and you get huge results from that. Um, but then usually there's also other things going on. So you address those two, but um, yeah. Uh, like, so you said, those... uh, like you said, uh, the older you get with those habits, the harder it is to break out because also if you think from a very physics perspective, the more yeah. time you, the more time you spend under gravity. So gravity yeah. also squ squishes the axial skeleton. So yeah. And, and that also being a huge factor and reinforcing the habits on top of that. Yeah. It's a cycle. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's, it's such a multi, and that's what I love about, that's what I love about pelvic floor health because it really gets you, it really helps you understand very specifically how our systems are not, we always, especially as PTs, we get into this idea that we are a musculoskeletal system only. And that that's all we do. And that's all there is, you know, all oh, the, you know, the guts, oh, whatever, you know, um, oh, sure. I treat the diaphragm, but what, you know, no, the colon, what does that have to do with, with how my, my patient moves? Um, you know, the position of organs, what does that have to do with how my patient moves um, and how those organs move? That doesn't have anything to do with how my patient moves. It all does because it all adds to this very complex system. And so to be able to talk to someone and help someone at, you know, three different levels, four different levels um, is really cool. And I think that's why, you know, being a pelvic floor therapist kind of before all of this other stuff, all this idea of, you know, the guts and the pressure of the guts came on, I was already there because I'm like, oh yeah, that makes perfect. That's what I do. And so I'm so glad to see it kind of being brought up into where, you know, therapists, PTs that are treating, you know, shoulder pain are thinking about their, you know, what, what's going on in the system, what's going on neurologically. Um, yeah. So it's super, super cool. Mm, true. To check something and, really quick. I'm so sorry. Yeah. No issues. Okay. Good. Yeah. And. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Talking about uh, pooch belly, rectus diastasis, these mm. are also pretty prevalent. So if you could throw some light on that as well. Um, this absolutely is. It's not only, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of women, you know, after you have babies, your, your body changes. And I'm going to speak on women really quick. Men deal with rectus diastasis too, but I'm going to speak to the female part for a moment. Um, uh, your body changes a lot and people, and just, just even how you feel in your body changes. And that's what people don't realize. Like, you know, a lot of, um, I think a lot of times our idea, the first thing to say to a woman after she has a baby, you know, you look fine. You just had a baby, you know, don't be so hard on yourself, but understand that there's like an internal change. So I was never like, I, I was never anyone who, really cared about my looks or anything like that. Um, and so I didn't really realize how it would affect me to have a baby, but I actually lost a lot of my strength because of how my system, my, my bones changed. And that affected me because that was a lot of who I was. Um, and so a ton changes with, with how your system reacts and how your bones bend when mm. you are carrying a baby. Mm. But then on top of that, what can, so what does happen because you're, you're expanding um, the, the linea alba that sit that, that spot between the, like the, the visual abs, you know, the six pack abs, it, when we have a baby, it, or when you get pregnant and, and carry to term, it expands It expands. It should expand. Absolutely. Mm. It should expand. That's what it's meant to do. Um, and so, um, but then what should, after you have the baby, what should happen is 
you know, over time, over like, you know, six to 12 months, everything should, should come back together. Hmm. And, um, uh, and, and that it, linea alba should in general shrink back up. Um, the problem is that um, sometimes it doesn't. And um, sometimes it doesn't because, you know, just maybe someone has a little more elasticity in this, their system. Maybe they've carried twins. Maybe they were very much like in a anterior pelvic tilt or, you know, the, the way that they were already shaped prior to having that baby kind of mm-hmm. um, put them at risk for, for that linea alba getting overly stretched. But let me tell you about the problem that no one talks about because it's such a freaking big marketing issue is no one wants to talk about it because it's a moneymaker, is that when women start to try to exercise, like um, overly exercise, when they weren't doing things prior to when they were pregnant, they try to get into these, or or they try to go, uh, maybe they were exercising kind of when they were pregnant, then they have this baby, they're super stressed out, they're, you know, prior to the baby, they're like, well, I worked out when I was stressed out, you know, I, I ran, um, or they, you know, they see that their stomach is, um, just doesn't look the same. They start to then do a lot of exercising, like strength training that they didn't do before. Um, on a very, um, unstable system, because Mm -hmm. when you get pregnant, um, and especially when you're nursing, your body still is releasing what's called relaxin and that loosens up all your joints, uh, for the baby to pass through, but that, provides a lot of that it provides a lot of instability in your system in general and so they start to work out beyond their ability Mm. um after pregnancy and what they so if you're working out beyond your your structural and muscular like your muscle your strength ability um you will always go to your pressure system right because that's what you need to to get a lot more stability in your system and so what they'll do is what, what would never have been turned into a problem, this diastasis recti, will become a problem because they're, they're using a pressure system, like they're, they're going, ah, pushing out that, which when you do that, you're, again, the pressure has to leave somewhere, right? So their, their linea alba will be pressed out mm. and continue and not get the rest that it needs to come back and oh. um, facilitate to get that, that stiffness back in it. So essentially they just keep pushing out on something that was supposed to stop, like nothing was supposed to keep pushing out on it mm. post-pregnancy, right? So I find that the, my patients that have the worst time are the ones that are seeing me a year post-pregnancy. And at six months, they bought that, they bought that video for, you know, post post-pregnancy, get your body back. And because, I mean, like, again, it's not always about like wanting to look right. It might just be about like the strength that they feel or the lack of movement they feel because they're in a house, they're, they're in a house, you know, for the last three months, um, with this infant and it was their way of, Oh, let me get out and this will be healthy Mm. or let me do something for myself. And a lot, and all this marketing is coming in. Well, let me, this is the healthiest way to find, you know, to find you again, or this is the healthiest way to get that body back. And without proper training, absolutely not. And you'll find it almost in all of them. Go look back. You'll see maybe two weeks of low level stuff. And then they progress it. And it's like, it's ridiculous progressions. (laughs) So like, you know, after three weeks of starting the program, you see people doing like high intensity lunges. I'm like, what are you, what are you doing? Um, when Lunge, these people- Lunges even... are so technical, so technical. Exactly, exactly. Oh, absolutely. And so these people don't even know how to access their deep abdominal muscles, let alone, you know, like- control their system and move like in such a high intensity technical positioning. So that is like, sorry about my soapbox, but ooh, yeah. that gets me because it causes such a problem. Yeah. Um, so um, we had talked a little bit about the beginning. This is a perfect segue into pre-training, you know, yeah. uh, like how do you train prior to having a baby? How do you train during, during pregnancy? And after. And after. So 
it's the funny thing is you think it like be super technical. It's a really easy answer. <laughs> um, teach, teach people. And this is, you know, this is getting into men too, any like, and um, who have any sort of pressure dynamic issue, but let's speaking to these, this, this pregnancy thing, teach someone foundationally how to properly manage their pressure system and what it feels like when they don't. So pre-pregnancy, if you can teach someone that exhale, like deep abdominal strategy before, before it's all like gone, gone to hell, essentially, if you can teach someone that and teach them what it feels like, don't just give them exercises that say this, you know, this will activate your deep abdominals or blow out, you know, it's like, okay, blow out. But what does that feel like when you blow out? Are you pulling in or are you just blowing out and pushing out? And so teaching someone as they blow out, see how this feels, see these, you know, do you feel this deepness and do you feel how you're sinking in? You're like, you're, you're essentially shrinking, you're vacuuming your system, not blowing out your system. And so teaching that early, um, then, then they get pregnant and they can use it. Hmm. So, and what that's going to do is if they're using it throughout their pregnancy, their body's able to essentially, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's that like, um, you know, loading some, it's, you know, that gradual loading, right? Because, you know, as you get more and more pregnant, the system gets bigger and bigger. And so, so you're having, you're naturally under more pressure, but if you can, if you can teach that, how to gauge, how to engage those deep abdominals with that proper breath, that proper pressure system. Um, and then, you know, you can go into a lot of positioning stuff here. I'm not going to get into that, but, um, you're, you're teaching them how to access those deep abdominals with that exhale, with this graded increase of, of like pregnancy pressure, then they have the baby. They've already learned the skill. You don't have to change anything. Then they go, then now after having the baby, they know when, when women who I work with, when they leave my office, the first question is, what can I do? Can I go back to orange? Like orange theory is a big thing in the U S it's essentially like that kind of high, high intensity stuff. Keep your heart rate up. Um, can I go back to yoga? Can I go back to, um, Pilates? Can I go back to CrossFit? The cool thing is, is this is what makes my job easy where I can sit back and I can say, you know what it feels like to Mm. use, to push out. And you know what it feels like to to properly engage and pull in. Mm. You can do whatever the heck you want because you, like by the time they've left here, we're doing pretty dynamic things. And they're the ones who can tell me towards the end, oh, I did that wrong. I pushed out, that was too hard for me. So when they start telling me, when they're the ones who start telling me if they did it properly, and I know that they have, they can do whatever they want because they know when they're doing it right. And they know when they're not, and they know how big of a deal it is to not do it right. Hmm. So that's how you, you train. It's not about training a, a person in three different times. It's about teaching them a skill that their body needs to understand how to do. It probably worked okay um, pre-pregnancy, but they didn't have a mind for it. And so they didn't, they didn't know about it. So you teach it then, Mm. then they put it under pressure. They put it under stress while they're pregnant. And then after pregnancy, they, they just use the skill that they've learned the whole time. So it's not rocket science. It's the communication between the patient the physical therapist and the patient's body. That's all it is. And so, and that's all anything is. That's treatment in general. If you're not teaching a patient what something should feel like, then you're, and you're just hoping that this exercise that you handed them is going to fix them and, and, you know, and, and be long lasting. Um, it's short-sighted. It can hmm. work, but it's short-sighted. True. Oh. According to your knowledge and experience, what would be the, some of the biggest pelvic floor myths in the industry, which needs to be busted? Yeah, absolutely. That a Kegel fixes everything. That's, <laughs> ooh, that's the worst. 
I had mentioned the bowel leakage. So like a lot of people leak bowel and they, and the doctors will send them in here for, for Kegel training, you know, for pelvic floor contraction training. When really what that is, it's, a, it's like an overflow. Their, their pelvic floor is so pulled up and they're so constipated that they're getting this like seepage around just because the system has gotten so full that finally the pressure just like kind of gives just enough. It's essentially like putting a huge bar on someone's back like a super heavy weight and squatting them. Well, yeah, at some point, you know, at some point their body will give and go into a squat um, just because of the excess weight on their shoulders. Does mm. it mean that their body really knows how to squat? It doesn't, right? They, if you take the, if you unload them and you have them squat, they can't do it, right? Um, so um, yeah, so, usually, so those people um, need to relax their pelvic floor. Um, and to learn how to, to yield in the system. So that's one of the biggest myths is that everything is solved from a Kegel. Yeah. Um, even like women with prolapse, a lot of people want them to do a lot of pelvic floor contractions. But again, it's like even pelvic floor therapists, as much as we know about the guts, they don't take the guts out of the way, mm. right? So that's when we do a lot of that, you know, and you've learned about just, and this is what's so cool about that transfer over. You bring someone up, right? And you let the guts fall in back. motion. Oh. Exactly. Then you have them contract, you know, teach them how to contract without their guts falling out. Mm. Um, that's where you can teach that motion. So um, for, those... for, the, for the viewers who didn't understand inversion, inversion is an activity where your hips are higher than your shoulders. So yeah, this, so everything flows this way. Yeah. Yeah. Your guts, your guts are as much, um, ruled by gravity is everything else. Everything so, is ruled by gravity, yeah. Exactly, exactly. You bring your hips up, your guts fall out of the way, then you can work on gentle contractions. Um, that's a big myth. Um, the other one is that like, um, I guess that um, just, I guess I always go back to, and this is what I would want anyone to ever learn from me that you've got to teach your patients what's happening. So a lot of people use, and how to do something. So a lot of people use biofeedback. I'm sure we've all heard about, you know, you've heard about biofeedback where they either put electrodes mm. um, just to the outside of the pelvic floor, like around the rectum, or they put a, like an insert into um, the vaginal canal or into the rectal canal. And you're trying to get people to relax and they look at a screen to see what they're doing. So they're getting this automatic feedback of, oh, the screen says I'm relaxing, so I must be relaxing. Well, if you've taken motor learning 101, you'll know that if someone gets too much feedback, they don't actually learn how to do it. They just learn how to read the screen. And, and so they'll do it lying down. They'll, oh yeah, I can, so the screen says I'm, and they're just lying down on the bed and looking at a screen. Okay, so I relaxed my pelvic floor, but there's no functional carryover because they're, they didn't really learn it. They just saw that they did it correctly. Um, and seeing that you do something correctly versus feeling your system are two really different things. And so being able, what I try to do is set people up in positions that, um, that uh, facilitate yielding. So that might, and everyone's a little bit different. That might be child's pose. That might be child's pose on a ramp. So their, their pelvis is above their head to get those, those organs out of the way um, and set them up in a position where they actually can feel what's happening in their pelvic floor because you're, you're putting them in the most successful position for them. Um, and that's usually very supported, very supported. Um, and then they can feel, it might be sideline. That's a really good position that I work in. Um, then they can feel what's going on in their pelvic floor with their breath, which is the more natural, um, how the system works more naturally. And so I would say that's a big, uh, that's, that's a big myth is that mm. you can just hook someone up to something and because they got it on a screen mm. that they're going to take that and use it functionally. Um, I'm trying to think of any other, and there's so many, I guess, <laughs> But um, 
Yeah, I, th I think the big, oh, uh, yeah, I think the biggest myth is that you can just do Kegels and it's going to fix everything, uh -huh. but that that someone's always doing a Kegel, that you can tell someone to do a Kegel or a, a pelvic floor contraction, they're doing it properly um, because usually they aren't, so. And uh, when to brace and when not to, the misconception yeah. around intra-abdominal pressure. <clears throat> That's you. Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. First of all, you're not allowed to brace until, I mean, unless like, you know, you're, like I said, you're getting sucker punched or you have to, you mm. know, pull yourself from a burning building. But like, when you're talking about like in the gym training, you shouldn't brace until you actually have control of your deep abdominals period. So if you don't know how to blow out and get those deep abdominals with an exhale in a move, like in more of a movement strategy, then bracing is going to, it's going to overwhelm the system. And again, they're going to be using that too much of that push out strategy. It's going to be, it's, it's all they use anyway. So they're going to use it for every activity um, where a bracing strategy is really supposed to be a one rep max strategy. It's a high, it's, it's a max load um, strategy or um, a low load, high velocity strategy, you know, like uh, you don't yeah. use a lot of weight, but you're power. going fast. Like, yes. Uh. Yeah, exactly. A power strategy. Um, and so, um, but so those are the times you, you should be using it, but those shouldn't be like, that shouldn't be in a major part of your training system all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, with like a one rep max, yeah, absolutely. You need to brace the heck out of that, but you should have such a foundation that those deep abdominals can handle that pressure brace. Just like we talked about training, like someone who was pregnant, you've taught, taught them the foundation. Well, they're gonna get pregnant and their belly's gonna grow. They're gonna have to, they're gonna be under a higher pressure load, but you have to at least have facilitation of those deep abdominals to hold back, to be able to be a counter a counterbalance to that big pressure system. So brace, absolutely brace. Do it, you know, when you're talking about one rep max stuff, do it um, when you have the foundation and don't do it as your only training strategy. You have mm -hmm. to have, you have to have movements that you're not using a bracing strategy. And um, a lot of people, it is their only strategy for their abs. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't want to admit it, but it is. And because we, we don't know how to check them in the first place. We don't know how to help them know if they're doing it right in the first place, you know? And that's where I feel like a lot of the PRI stuff went wrong is we were putting people in these positions and we were telling them to do this stuff and, and it worked fine for some people, but a lot of people didn't know what they were feeling. They were doing all this heavy exhaling, pushing their bellies out because they weren't taught what was actually supposed to be happening. Um, they weren't put in enough of a supported position to feel what their body should feel like to get those deeper postural like that deeper um uh the deeper abs the deeper pelvic floor like the position and the position the position drives the 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 motion right so you teach that first you make sure that they have a foundation you build that up then you can work in high pressure systems like situations because everyone does you should absolutely and that's my thing like you don't stop at these like exhale activities you just get that working that's the foundation then you can do the rest then absolutely you should you should stress the system with some pressure within the limits of the system so just saying well everyone is going to have to do it so just do it is really short-sighted because if your system can't handle it you're not going to do it effectively so train the system up to handle it, then you can add it. And then that's the same with the, like with using power stuff hmm. um, under like using, you know, power exercises, absolutely use power exercises, bring up the foundation. So they have, they have that structural strength to be able to manage the increased pressure in the system. If you get the deep abdominals positioned and working well um, and knowing like teaching that person how that system should work, then it's a no brainer. They can, of course they can manage that pressure hmm. of a, you know, like of a, of a bracing, of a bracing strategy. What are the biggest breathing drill mistakes that you see people doing? Um, 
first of all, not supporting the not supporting the client in a way that they can actually have um, have a mental idea of what they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, if someone doesn't understand how to, if they're, if they're trying to hold, if they're trying to posture their system or hold their system, um, if they're, if, if they're trying to still use their, their pelvic floor and their diaphragm as a, like a, a stabilizer, then they're not going to be able to yield through it. Right. Cause it's trying to do something else and their body's stressed. Like their body's still holding that stress of, I need to hold myself up. That can even be in, in sideline. If someone's in side lying and doesn't seem relaxed, then their system isn't going to give, isn't going to give or move from, from the position that they feel the safest or the strongest in. And so you might have to put a pillow, you know, in front of someone, put them against the wall, put a pillow under their left abdomen to provide some stability on that left side in order for them to feel what that breathing system should be doing properly. Um, so then you, you give them the support, then their system can relax, yield from brain to body. <clears throat> then they will be able to access that movement that the, that the breath should bring. The breath should bring movement. If the breath isn't bringing movement, then it doesn't, it's not doing anything. And people are alive, right? They're not, they're not falling over dead. Um, so they are getting oxygen into their lungs and out of their lungs. So, um, it's not just about the breathing in and out. You've got to posture someone to allow their system to yield. It might be posture. You might have them have to have them, you know, do a little bit of meditation prior to, or some sort of like some sort of even movement meditation, something prior to trying to train them to get their system to, to start that mobility process. So like, I always like compliment what Lucy and Dave do at Enhancing Life is before someone starts working out, they get them on the floor, they have them start breathing just to relax, to come down because that's that even just that moment of relaxation support on the floor will help for a lot of, for a lot of people just start opening up that movement to different movement patterns. So that's one of the big things. The others is that you can cope, you can say like even the, you know, like, oh, if, if a person is this body type or, you know, if they're, a, if they're a narrow or a wide angle, you know, you'll, you'll hear those, those concepts thrown around that to give them, oh, we'll have them breathe like this or have them breathe like this. You still have to watch what they're doing. Hmm. You still have to watch what their belly's doing. You can't just assume that you putting them in a position that, you know, Bill, Bill Hartman told them to, to put them in and a breath that Bill Hartman said would be good and assumed that you can't watch it. Bill watches it. Bill watches what they do. And then he adjusts. We all, anyone who's, anyone who's been doing this and in the trenches, clinical or on the gym floor, what you will see is that, you know, you can have this general base of knowledge of like, okay, we're going to start here. But everyone, even in that, in that, even in that area will be, um, will react differently to different positions for all sorts of reasons. Hmm. Um, so you have to still watch and you have to be aware of what's around you. What could be stressing? I mean, breath and stress you know, they're like this. So I don't care. You could have someone in the most relaxed position. You could have them propped up on every pillow, but let's just say, um, um, let's just say something in like in your space is stressful to them. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, some women even, like even, even my presence could be stressful to them. Absolutely. And, and it's okay to be like, you know, that you might, might need some, someone else, or, you know, there's a million things. There might be a, I mean, we can take, make, we can take it to the silliest. There might be a song mm. on the radio that like their, you know, significant other broke up to them, you know, uh, it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. it can be simple, but it can also be really complex. Like, um, uh, if, if anyone who's had trauma mm. is in a position 
that makes them feel really vulnerable, even if it seems like it should be really relaxing for them, if it makes them feel vulnerable, then they're not going to, I'm mm. sorry, they're not going to release anything for you. Because again, like biomechanics is great, but it's only so good, like positional, all that stuff is only so good. Um, the brain will always, exactly, the brain will always win the day. And so if someone's stressed about something and if you put them in a position that seems like it should be a winner and it's not, don't, you know, like readjust, hmm. you know, you can always, you can always work in a different position. You can support someone in a different position. Um, so awareness, understanding that, you know, environment and someone, what, what someone's bringing as their person plays a huge role. Um, I, I think is probably where a lot of people go wrong. Mm. And anytime you're, you're yelling at someone to relax, they're mm. not going to relax. I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> um, so yeah, those, those are my big takeaways and none of them are like, I, I always laugh. Like I don't, um, I don't work in, you know, in these like complex, you know, concepts. I work in reality and connections between the body and the brain and uh, teaching people that not just keeping it, not just keeping it to myself, but teaching people, teaching my patients, teaching other PTs, how those systems work together. Hmm. What are the common male pelvic floor issues that you see? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, I see, I see a lot of constipation. I see a lot of um, general, like I said, stress incontinence, urge, urge incontinence. Um, but then I see a lot of pelvic floor pain um, and endometriosis is a big one. Um, talk about oof, that, that one can be a doozy, but um, pelvic floor pain, whether it be with, you know, having a bowel movement or whether it be with intercourse, um, um, like you said, uh, like um, pelvic floor pain in men, which is, there's not as much information. I mean, it, it all falls under the same category. Like it should be treated the same, but you know. Yeah, like um, erectile dysfunction and heart mm -hmm. flaccid. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, as well, yeah, absolutely. It just, and even pain with erection. Hmm. Like it's, you know, it's all there. Um, and it all, kind of, it all comes down to the same things. It's, it's position, pressure, cognition so um or or and not just cognition like autonomic nervous system as well you put them all together hmm. and you, you're just looking at everyone within that within those things and then you don't have to worry about i didn't i haven't treated this before i haven't treated that before it all fought it all falls under that same those same things and so if you can instead of trying to be like you know oh and I love, like, I love this stuff. And I think it's so important to learn as you go, the concepts of iteration, like how, you know, how the thorax is similar to the pelvis or the cranium, all that stuff is so good. But at the end of the day, don't worry so much if, you know, if you don't have it perfectly, just, you know, keep, keep kind of this basic understanding of people's systems need to yield and they need to move. Um, you need to understand how people's brains and, you know, play into that hmm. and how, if you can set them up into a position that's relaxing and then ask them to do whatever you want them to do, it's going to work. It might take a few tries and that's hmm. okay, but it's going to work. Get people to get people's systems to, to relax, to yield, and you, you can make a huge difference. Um, so, yeah, so like I said, I treat everything within that boundary, the, you know, those, those concepts. How are they using their pressure system? What's stopping them from using it properly? So, um, learning how to master the pressure, pressure system will also help in uh, the delivery of baby for women. Very crucial. Yeah, right. Just like, like, I hate to take it back to this, but just like passing a bowel movement, if you're grunting and going, ah, your pelvic floor is pulling up, breathe, breathe in as you're pushing, push as you breathe in, 
And then as you breathe out, try to relax. Just, you know, just try to melt. Breathe in and push, relax, or, you know, breathe out and melt. Like it, it, that's exactly it. But if you don't, if you don't practice that a lot of pre delivery, you're not going to have mastered it. There's no way. And then I'm going to give every woman this out that, you know, if she has a C-section, she didn't fail at anything. Like, you, you know, like there's so much pressure on, oh, you didn't learn this before you had a bit, you know, before you delivered and, and it went wrong for you. I just, I just, we all have so much crud, you know, so much stress in our lives that, you know, that, and with modern mate medicine, like you could have breathed perfectly, but if the baby was turned a certain way or, no. you know, the baby's head was too big for your pelvis, you lose. So modern medicine, C-sections are okay. You know, all of that stuff. There should never be any kind of blame about how, what happened in delivery on the person who gave birth to that baby. So I just, I, sorry. Um, mm. I want that to always be very, very clear that, yeah. Thank goodness less women die in childbirth nowadays. Huh, true. Lifestyle tips for people who want to manage and overcome pelvic floor issues, like people who are desk job employees and they have worked for eight, 10, 12 hours. So how, how can they incorporate small stuff whose cumulative yeah. volume over a period of time can yield results? Absolutely. One, one of the biggest things is when you get home or when, when you finally like get to the point where you can relax, find, you know, you can lie on your right side or lie on your left side with um, like with a, a blanket roll under your left side for the support um, that becomes, that's an organ issue. Um, you have a little more support on your right than your left. And so to give that, like that blanket roll will help kind of relax the right pelvis down a little bit, the right side of the pelvis down a little bit, but then find the position that you're most relaxed. And that might be on your back with your legs up and take those breaths, those breaths in that are deep and low where you imagine it. Don't, don't try to force anything. Everyone tries to force things as you're breathing in, just imagine your, your pelvic floor, just opening with your breath in. And as you breathe out it, the doors, you don't close the doors. The doors just close on themselves. You breathe in, you, you know, breathe in, focus on that pelvic floor opening just just imagine it it happens it happens naturally like when your system kind of goes back into its proper function it will happen naturally so i hate for people to try hmm. so that will send this anytime you're trying you're thinking of contracting so don't try just imagine and just the deep low breaths if you feel like your shoulders are raising or you're getting a lot of a lot of belly take a take a smaller like take a a lesser of a breath and again focus think about that pressure of that breath going to your tailbone um this is and imagine is your sit bones kind of opening and closing with the breath this is, um, this is crucial because uh, the major breathing flaws that i see in people are be because we have our phones so we have this kind of ocd kind of a thing that if we charge it we charge it to the full so people think mm -hmm. so people think oh lungs they have to be filled up 100 yes. percent. so they start great and then end up right they went into comp compensatory strategy to take more air in which is a sympathetic strategy because yeah. when we think about or a light or flight fight or flight strategy because we when we think about um taking a full breath in mm. we're thinking go big go mm. you know do the most and that will contract your body to take that punch to be ready for to be vigilant we don't want to be vigilant we want to be relaxed. And so to take a lower breath in, a lesser of a breath. Here, exactly. I always say, take a gentle, when I talk to my patients, take a gentle breath in. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, yep, and a low, heavy breath. Because when you think of heaviness, you think of grounding mm -hmm. down. You're um, mel melting on the floor. You're melting. Exactly. Exactly. Even the, even the exhalation has issue because mm -hmm. people think, oh, I have to get everything out. All the out. Yep. <sighs> Rectus, yep. all six pecs. Then. Yes, exactly. And those are all, I mean, you know, it's so interesting because when you learn about, um, when you learn about how 
like, you know, people with like cystic fibrosis or, you know, things like that, the way that they have to breathe and all that compensatory musculature and, you know, and people that don't have huge medical issues are breathing like that. That's problematic, you know? So being able to teach someone that's exactly it, how to, how to melt, how for things to be deep and heavy um, and less. I constantly am telling my patients and they laugh. They're like, no one's told me that before. Try less, try yeah. less because the more effort you give, the more, the more stiffness you're going to bring into your system. This is exactly what I tell to my clients. I tell them awesome. like in every other field of your life, you need yeah. de determination, you need effort yes. and everything. Not here. Yes, that's awesome. I love it. Don't try. Yeah. Don't try. Yeah. <laughs> Just let it be. Oh, absolutely. You know, the example I always give is, you know, if you've ever seen like a, a little kid, like play their, like a sport for the first time, like uh, swing a bat, they, they contract everything, mm -hmm. you know, and they swing all the way around because they're trying so hard and they're so stiff. Um, but then when you see like a professional athlete, mm -hmm. you know, like a professional baseball player, tr cricket player, you know, yeah. And it looks so smooth and effortless because they have mobility. They don't have to try with every muscle in their body. We're trying to become, we're trying to become the professional athlete, mm. not the kid swinging the bat. And so being able to take it down, relax, release is going to, to open up that system so much more. Um, well, yeah, continue. Oh yeah, no, you're good. Well, what tips would you give to someone I mean, so if someone is a corporate employee, eight to 10 hours on the on table and chair, what can that person do on the table and chair so that he or she can offset okay. some of the stagnancy? Absolutely. So again, so if they're, they're sitting there, get back and always get back into your chair, not the relaxed bag. It has to be a nice firm bag. Yeah. Get back into your chair. And if the wheels are too wheely, that's mm. a problem too. Like if you're getting back and your wheels are pulling you back, yeah. get your... Yes, exactly. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh, sure a, a, lot, a lot of people do this as well, like down chest. Oh, yeah, exactly. It, you know, and one of my things is make sure that you can, see, I, I've had patients, make sure that you can, like it said, it's a good computer that you can see because a lot of people are bringing themselves out of the chair because they're working on a tiny laptop in front of them and they can't see it. So, like, you know, bring the computer to you. So uh, don't try to be straight up and back and have everything really far away from you where you're gonna inevitably, because your eyes are stressed, you're gonna come forward. Remember your body will always go for the thing that it feels like it needs the most. Huh. And so your back will hurt if you, you know, and you won't think about it because you're trying to, you're trying to see something you won't care about. Your body won't care about the stress in your back because you're, you're trying to just see the computer and that's, that's like your focal stress. So bring the computer up to you bring yourself back to the chair. And then those that the same breathing strategies and chairs can be a nice place to feel it sometimes. Mm. So if you can breathe in that low, deep breath and see if you can like feel the pressure of the breath gently, because you, you shouldn't have to try or so just imagine the pressure of the breath going into the chair um, and relaxing into the chair doing the pauses can help with that. So when we pause, that's why the box breathing, like pause four seconds before exhale, pause four seconds before inhale, what that's doing is it's actually, it's pushing your system back into an auto, like into the rest or digest. Because when we're in a sympathetic or that fight or flight, our bodies want to sit, our body wants to have a lot of inhale, exhale to try to oxygenate the system, but you're not running. So it's just getting over oxygenated without anywhere to go. So, um, but, so what happens is you start in order to breathe like that, you have to use muscles to breathe like that. That's what we're talking about. Like those, that big rectus breathing or, you know, the big chest shoulder breaths. But if you can pause, what you do is you take the system back down to essentially physics, atmospheric pressure, like letting the exhale come out because of an at atmospheric pressure differential. So, you know, the lungs are filled for when the lungs are are deflated. So after you've exhaled, naturally, after about four seconds, your body, your, your, your body, your, your brain, like will realize that um, there's less air, there's less atmospheric pressure in your lungs. 
as compared to out. And so the air will flow in naturally because of physics. I shouldn't even say the brain, it should just be physics. And then the same thing, now the atmospheric pressure is higher in your lungs than outside. So naturally, because of general physics, the air will come out because of always trying to get that balance of the pressure, you know, again, pressure system of that atmospheric pressure. Um, so use, and that's why that kind of stuff can be so good to de-stress our systems. When your system's de-stressed, naturally your body will relax. So using the box, breathing four seconds in, four second pause, four second out, four second pause. Some people can't do that because they're so sympathetically oh, yeah, yeah. driven. So you take it to one or two seconds, whatever they can do, and you build off of it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It never has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. It can always be within that person's ability. Yeah. So awesome. My... Awesome, Sarah. It was incredible chatting with you. I Good. I hope so. This was fun. The viewers will learn a lot from this, and it has been an incredible experience learning from you. Yeah, pelvic floor issues are something that needs to be talked about yes. often and absolutely awareness needs to be created yeah absolutely and let's go over you know like pain with intercourse not normal you know mm. urinating when you don't want to not normal leaking bowel not normal a constipation not normal um pain with sitting not normal Hmm. Um, clothes, not being able to like sen sensitivities, like having issues with clothes touching near your pelvic floor re region, that's not normal. So yeah, absolutely seek out pelvic floor physical therapy because they can kind of get into the systems a little bit better. Hmm. Um, and so, but I think a lot of the jobs of other physical therapists and other strength coaches are to flag it and, and to you know, try to find the, the right person to help be part of the process of addressing it. True, true. Awesome catching up and we'll catch up someday soon. It was Absolutely. Fun. Thanks for having me. Yes. Thank you. Bye. I hope you liked this episode. And if you did, please like, share and subscribe to my channel. And I'll be coming up with such exciting episodes in the future as well. Thank you.